Biggest problem with all negotiations is not coming to agreement, it's implementation. Human nature is being implemented against us and the sharks that are gonna take advantage of you know it. And it works because you're a human. Sometimes it's gonna go bad, even when you do everything right. And that's where I realize the best chance of success is you play the cards you dealt the best you can play them. And overall, the more skilled players win. We got nine skills, essentially, and each one of them is perishable, which means if you don't get some practice in, when tomorrow comes, I'm going to be worse. You're going to be worse. Don't pressure yourself to learn quickly. You don't got to learn faster. You just got to keep learning. If you never give up, you can't lose. Hi, and welcome to the Erica Taught Me podcast, where we learn something new each week to better position ourselves for success. I'm your host, Erica Kohlberg, and I'm a lawyer and money expert. Today, I'm interviewing Chris Voss, who is a former FBA hostage negotiator and author of the best-selling book, Never Split the Difference. In this episode, we're going to learn how to implement FBI negotiation tactics into our everyday lives. I'm Erica Kohlberg. This is Erica Taught Me, and today we are here with Chris Voss. When I see you, you come off as so sure of yourself and such an expert in negotiating. But I imagine there was a time or a situation where you weren't so confident that everything that you've been trained to know about negotiating would actually work in that real life scenario. Can you think of something like that? When I wasn't as confident. When you weren't as confident, when you weren't sure the tactics that you had learned would actually work out in this real life scenario. Uh, well, so I worked on competence for a really long time. I mean, that's kind of a, something that's come up recently in conversations, like the difference between competence and confidence. So when I first started, it was a no risk. I started learning in what I thought saw as a no risk environment, which was volunteering on a suicide hotline. Now, why did I see that as a no risk environment? Well, really, I went there to learn a skill and they were so good uh, at teaching that by the time I was actually on the line, I, I, I was confident that the process was the best it could be. So to me, it's leaning, you know, learning a process, gaining competence in a process, and then the feeling of understanding the difference between guarantees of success and best chance of success. My old boss, Gary Nessner, used to talk about best chance of success all the time which I didn't realize till I had a kidnapping turn into an absolute train wreck that I thought, well, best chance of success means that you're not always going to succeed. So I've always been good with, eh, it might not work out, but I've got the best approach possible, which then we're constantly getting better. Like we never stop getting better. We are, the Black Swan Method is light years beyond what it was as we were writing the book, because we're always trying to get better. So just because we believe we're as, uh, the best we could be at the, at the time, that doesn't mean we don't stop improving. So I just got a belief in the process, and I, and I lean into it, and I don't worry about let the outcome go. Be very zen-like. Mm. What happened with the kidnapping that went awry? Well, it, w it went bad from the very beginning. Like, it was a mess, because we just finished the kidnapping. It was in the Philippines. And we just finished the kidnapping. Well, we got the upper hand on the bad guys, and a hostage walked away. And so no ransom was paid. Nobody got killed. And I think all the agencies were frustrated that they didn't have this great, the Philippine government, you know, didn't have the opportunity to show how many bad guys they killed. And the U.S. government, was didn't li li love the taste that it left in their mouth because we didn't noticeably strike any blows against terrorism. So that case finishes up, and a month later, I'm back in the Philippines on another kidnapping of Americans, and everybody, there are too many cooks in the kitchen. Like, the negotiator that I'd coached in a previous negotiation, remarkably coachable guy, former tactical guy, Actually, not former. He was a tactical guy. He was a commander of their SAF, their Special Action Force, which is their version of Delta Force, the police department's ver Philippine National Police version of Delta. And they were, 
dangerous, deadly guys. Exactly what you want from special forces guys. But that leader was eminently coachable. So he was good being coached in negotiations. So I turn around and we're back a month later. They're not letting us use this guy. Because to be a great, to be involved in the negotiations, you handle the negotiations and you kind of let command know what's going on afterwards. Command doesn't dictate what's said. So they literally, they turn around and give us another colonel who's not coachable, has got a drinking problem, will not record the conversations with the terrorists, which, you know, I said, Here, here's a tape recorder. Keep it with you at all times. You can't predict when the bad guys are going to call you. Just tape the call. And then we'll talk about it afterwards. And he get back to us, meet us on time or be late and say, oh, yeah, I just got off the phone with the terrorists. Well, what do they say? Well, I don't know. I don't remember. Uh, and I didn't record it. I mean, that's how that started. And then we also got the impression that we found out that he would never tell us about his interaction with the bad guys until after he'd briefed his commanders. His commanders didn't want the Americans know to know what was going on before they knew what was going on. So then by the time we talked to this guy, the conversation is hours old at best, maybe a day old. And so the craziest thing that happened, among the crazy things, fairly early, we're less than three weeks into it, we show up and we're doing, handling the negotiations out of Philippine National Police Headquarters in Manila. We're meeting a negotiator there every day, and we're getting there bright and early. And we get there early one day, and Philippine National Headquarters is closed. Like, this is like going to the White House, and the White House is closed. Like, it's closed. Like, they got these great big giant gates, and the gates are locked. You know, we're used to the gates being open and then being security guards, and we just we blast right through, and the gates are locked. And it closed. Like, what the hell's going on? So we start banging on the gate to get in. And uh, somebody finally comes to the gate and goes, yeah, we're closed. It's a national holiday. It's a national holiday? Like, why? You, you guys didn't tell us that yesterday. Yesterday, you guys knew today was a national holiday. Nobody said anything to us. Well, we f just figured you knew. And uh, they're, they're, well, it, it ain't a national holiday for the terrorists. And then a threat comes in to kill one of the Americans. And we simultaneously find out that the bad guys like killing Americans on national holidays. They, 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 national holiday is a great time to kill a hostage, get maximum visibility. So now we can't get in. There's a working threat on the hostages. We don't know where our negotiator is. He's out of pocket. We finally get in, and we, we got a legitimate, we got, these are all the earmarks for somebody to carry through a threat. If it's a day that means something to them, then it's a good time. And that's how that started. <laughs> oh, my goodness. And that was symbolic of nearly the lack of coordination from agencies on both sides of the government, not collaborating with the negotiators, because in the previous case, the negotiators knew what was going on before anybody else did, which we should. And then consequently... When they found out what was going on in the previous case, by then I would have a written strategy document laid out. Here's what happened. Here's how we analyze what happened. Here's what we think should be done. Now, this is compelling strategy in a written format. And we started hearing behind the scenes, we're, in, we're tired of the negotiators making all the decisions. Now, negotiators don't command. Commanders don't negotiate. So negotiators don't make decisions. We didn't. We just had compelling recommendations that the people that were jealous of our influence on the de decision makers then began to say, well, the negotiators are making all the decisions. Sometimes it's going to go bad, even when you do everything right. And that's where I realize the best chance of success is you play the cards you dealt the best you can play them. And overall, the more skilled players win. It's kind of a lesson I learned from, uh, I'm a fan of Molly Bloom. Molly's game, ran some poker games. Uh, she's, she's a phenomenal human being. She got arrested by the FBI. I like to say that um, I was in customer service and she was a customer. <laughs>
But Molly, Molly learned in poker games, everybody has the same luck. You got bad nights, you got good nights. If everybody has the same luck, then the skilled players win. And that doesn't mean you win every night. It just means you win more than anybody else does. So what happened with that case? On a national holiday, you can't find even the negotiator. Well, um, then uh, the first American uh, to die, uh, but not the first hostage to die. He was executed the next day, Guillermo Cibero. There had already been some Filipinos that had been executed in, as the bad guys were escaping from the Philippine army. So there was a little bit of a body count by that time anyway. It very much looked like they had the bad guys cornered early in the case. Uh, there's no way that they didn't bribe their way out from the military, to just pay a bribe to get out. Uh, Gracia Burnham wrote a book called In the Presence of My Enemies. Gracia Burnham of the three American hostages is the only one that lived. And she talks about when they were, the, the bad guys and the hostages were cornered in a hospital and it was surrounded. And, this, and I arrived in theater, if you will, right after they got cornered in this hospital. And as this thing is getting ready to go down, um, we figure people are going to die overnight. Um, I, we just did a, there's a documentary about me and my company called Tactical Empathy that just got finished. It, we screened here, here in, in LA and Bev, Beverly Hills a week ago. It's going to be released over the coming months. So we figure that this is going to be a firefight overnight. And um, I get up in the morning and uh, it's quiet. Like, I go to bed that night fully expecting to be woken up in the middle of the night while people are telling me about how bad this has gone down. And I wake up, and nobody's around. I mean, I'm in this military compound, small military compound, and I, like, I didn't set an alarm because I didn't think I was going to wake some, I didn't think sunshine was going to wake me up. And I wake up, and the birds are chirping, and I get up, and nobody is around. And I start walking around, all the military personnel are just gone. And I find out that in the, in the middle of the night, the bad guys went out the back. It was supposed to have been, they sh were supposed to have a perimeter of military around the back of the hospital. The perimeter had gotten called away to a briefing. Just called away to a briefing with nobody to take their places. And somehow the terrorists decided at the precise time that the outer perimeter in the back had been called away, they decided it's okay to walk away. And Gracia Burnham talks about, in her book, coming out of the back of the hospital expecting to walk into a firefight, mm -hmm. and it was empty, deserted streets. And the hostages are walking out, like, shocked at what they're looking at. Like, they think... Literally, that they're hallucinating that they're walking down an empty street in a town after having been cornered in a hospital and having had a firefight been ongoing for some time. Wow. It was, it was, but that was. So the bad guys paid off the cops to go to that briefing at that time. I'm also told that hostages witnessed a military officer come inside the hospital during the siege and witness the terrorist hand him a briefcase. Oh, my goodness. That's unconfirmed reporting. You know, just like it's, I don't know that the rear perimeter was why they get called away to a briefing. I just know they were gone. And I know when the bad guys knew they were going to be gone because they nonchalantly, they didn't make, they didn't, it wasn't a bust out. You know, they, they, didn't, they didn't try to uh, shoot a hole in a perimeter and escape through the hole. I've seen terrorists do that. They walked out. And so the hostage walked out with them. The hostages, there were multiple hostages at the time that, that they left uh, the Lamitan hospital. There were three Americans and multiple Filipinos. And they're just, the bad guys are just trying to escape and they're, relocate to different places. They're walking out. They're keeping the hostages herded with them. You know, like they're herding... Yeah. Probably like herding cats. And, uh, and they got away. When do you find them next? Well, then we, we don't find them. What happens is there's sort of a 13-month um, ensuing uh, of events where the hostages are on the run. The bad guys with the hostages are in constant movement. Find out after the fact we're being misled about where they are. 
we think they're in, they're they're in one part of the country on an, on an island. There's an uh, what's the term archipelago? Archipelago, mm-hmm. forgive me, of islands all over. The Philippines is all islands. And so down in the south, there's all these islands, and we're being led to believe that they're in one area. We find out after the fact they're probably in another, and but they were on the run the whole time, for roughly thirteen months. The the terrorists are ransoming out the Filipinos to the Philippine families. Filipinos understand it's a game plan. You want your family member back, you pay ransom. I mean, it's strange. Different cultures have different rules wherever you go. First rule of anything. What are the local rules? You know, ransom and kidnapping exist. People steal stuff and give it back to you if you pay them. Whether it's the Burnhams talked about when they first got to the Philippines, uh, uh, one of their kids had a bicycle stolen, and the people that stole the bicycle wanted to pay them to get it, give it back. They ransomed the bike. So the Filipinos, are, uh, their confidence in their government getting them, getting them out is low. So they're buying, they're buying their fam- loved ones out. Uh, the bad guys, as they're scampering to stay one step ahead of the military that is pursuing them uh, to the, the degree of vigor that they're being pursued is up to debate. But... You know, they're either ransoming out hostages or while they're on the run, they're picking them up more hostages. They're keeping themselves. It's a commodities game. It's a commodity. Mm-hmm. And at that so point, when you was, run low, you, you pick up some more. And what was your stance on ransoms? For the U.S. hostages, do you pay ransoms? So the ransom policy as it was, which I think ha- is it how it survived, is um, very similar to the reason you have bait money in a bank. You, you give a bank teller bait money so that when a bank robber comes in and the bank robber demands money, if the teller says, we're not paying you, there's a pretty good chance that the bank robber is going to shoot the teller and leave or take the teller hostage. If they have bait money, they can give them a small amount of money, which then becomes evidence, and the bank robber leaves the bank with the evidence, and the teller lives... And then you catch up with the bank robber. So and it's real money, but you have the exact serial numbers. You got, you got the money's marked. You got the serial numbers. Money's actually very, very easy to trace, which is why, you know, there's so many money laundering laws because it's easy to trace money. And the bad guys find it easy. And so there's, there's all these mechanisms. So you give the bad guys the money, the teller doesn't die, no hostages are taken. And then on top of that, like a bank robber doesn't rob the bank by himself. He's got a getaway driver. You know, he's got a boss back at bank robber headquarters. He's got people that helped him plan the bank robbery. He's got people that are going to take the bank robbery money and they're going to use it and they're going to put it in their network. Like you want to follow the money. You want to get more than just the guy that robbed the bank. And so the hostage policy is to not pay, give them the, every dollar in the vault, like the Europeans do, the Europeans pay millions of dollars for ransom. Mm. The Americans don't. The Americans are like, look, uh, and the American government doesn't pay, but will allow you to pay. What does that mean? Um, if the Burnham family can put up the money, and it's not my job as an advisor is for it to not be every last dime they have. You know, if you, if you if if your if your parents are grabbed, you know, Martin Grace and Burnham, um, they get family in the United States, they get kids in the Philippines, they get they get a sister in Cincinnati. They would all have gladly mortgaged their homes with no means of paying off the mortgage to getting their family members out. Like if we can get them out for them not mortgaging their homes. Because then, then they're victimized twice. Mm-hmm. Then, they, then their, finan- their future is devastated because all their financial resources are gone. So we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna not let them give every dollar in the bank vault to do that. We're going to save their finances, which was when I was running the operation, which is a very tricky thing. Because you've got a family member who says, I don't care how much it takes. This is how much I have. Put it on the table. And my job is to go, well, not so fast. Um, number one, they're probably not going to let them go if you pay what they want right now. Number two, while you don't care right now, I can't let your family be financially devastated. So I'm not going to let that happen. But 
and it's simultaneously same thing. Bad guys, you give you give the kidnappers what they want, which actually happens. They say, "Oh, oh, oh, that was a down payment." Because what are you going to do? Zoom? <laughs> no. Call <them> names? <laughs> no, you got to you got to make sure that when they get the deal, and this is like any business deal. Because if the others, if you give, if you're selling your car and you think you're asking a high price for it and the buyer says, okay, and immediately agrees. Then you feel bad. You feel like I should have asked for more. I should have asked for more. The kidnappers are human beings. Somebody says, okay, you got a deal. They're going to feel like I should have asked for more. And since they're out in the jungle someplace, they're not face to face. They're gonna sit. They're gonna sit there and think about it. And they're gonna go like, you know what? That eh, it was that was a down payment. You you guys you didn't understand the deal. So if I, if let's say my dog was kidnapped and I have what kind a, of dog you got? I don't have a dog. Oh, I was gonna say, and your little dog too. Right? I don't want to say someone I really. <laughs> I'll be have. a wicked witch. <laughs> hey, if my too. if my dog is kidnapped and I have a hundred thousand dollars that I want to pay to get it back, right? What do you go? Do you Go to the kidnappers and say 50000 first, or what would you do? What would your strategy be? Well, if we got into bargaining, if we got into bargaining, by the way, I'll, I'll do a shameless ad to never split the difference. Okay. <laughs> I love the book. It's, uh, it's one of the hard bargaining is, is one of the chapters in the book, and we got a system called the Ackerman Method, which is if you're going to bargain, it's guaranteed to get you your price, and you may even get it the deal well before you even get to your price. So I, I got I got to know what your aspiration value is, uh, whether or not you've made the first demand, if the other side has gone first, or I just got to know what I want to pay. And so if we get into it, then I'm uh, if I'm paying, I'm coming in at sixty five percent of my target, not your ask. Sixty five percent of my target. Now before I drop that number on you. I'm going to say, I'm scared you're going to get mad at me. You know, if I tell you what I could pay, you're going to get upset. You're going to scream. You're going to get really, you're going to get upset with me. And I'm really afraid of upsetting you. What are you going to do? Whether you're selling a car or whether you're selling a hostage, you're going to want my number. So if I get you to promise in advance not to get angry, like already you're thinking like, all right, so I'm not going to like this number. But I really want to know, and it's just a start, so I got to get this number to get the price. And you're going to say, look, I'm not going to get mad. Literally, that's what everybody does because you feel in charge. If I say I'm scared of making you mad at me, like you feel powerful in that moment. Yeah. You know, you're almost omnipotent. So you're happy to say, nah, I'm not, I'm not going to get mad at you. I'm, I'm not going to get mad. I won't get mad, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> and so then I come in at 65% of my number. Now, no matter how you react, it, even if it makes you mad, you're going to go like, ah, well, you know, it's kind of worn. We'll work with this. Now, where I'm going is I've got three raises planned. And if strictly by the numbers, you go to 65 to 85 to 95 to 100. Now, each one of those increases is half the size of the previous increase. And decreasing increments is the key, the first key. Because each time you beat me into a new number, you at least subconsciously notice that you gained less ground. So you're going to feel like you're really pushing me and that I'm being pushed to my limit. Now, I'm also in between each one. I'm gonna hit you with tactical empathy. Like, you know, and whatever that may be. Like, and, and that's expressing the other side's perspective to them. Expressing their perspective to them without agreeing it, without disagreeing. Just expressing it. Like, you feel justified in this amount of money. And then I'm gonna hit you with some sort of a calibrated question how do I know you're going to let them go if we pay? How do I know they're alive? How am I supposed to pay if I don't know they're alive? 
Like I've now created this deferential decision loop, which is fatiguing. If you ask somebody a great how or great what question, regardless of circumstances, for them to think it through before they even give you an example, uh, an, an answer, requires in-depth thought, which is fatiguing. And so then, after we go through this loop, where you're reassuring me, you're not arguing with me, I'm being deferential, you're reassuring me that it's going to be all right, over and over and over, then I'm going to try to get you to drop your price, because you're going to try and stimulate the process by giving me a better price, which now frees me to be grateful. How generous you're being. Then I'm going to drop back into the, the decision loop, the fatigue loop, but then I'm going to come back with another number. Then when I jump from 65 to 85, you're going to be like, oh, sweet. All right, we're getting someplace. It's still not where I want to be, but I just... I score, I put points on a board. Then when my next move after we've gone through this process is at 95, you were like, all right, I scored some more points, but I didn't score as many points this time as I scored last time. So you start to feel the process slow down. And by the time we get to where I want to stop, yeah. I'm, it's going to be an odd number. Like odd, go to a store and try to find something that doesn't sell for an odd number. You can't find it. <laughs> <laughs> odd numbered pricing works. So when I get to, I, I probably use some odd numbers, but the, the number I'm landing on is going to be an odd number. And then I'm going to say, and my car. And you're going to say, what am I going to do with your car? Like if, if it may be a nice car. First of all, I got a car. Secondly, if, if you give me your car, then I got to figure out how to sell it. What am I going to do with a car? I got to sell it, you know, which then is this whole loop. But also when I shift to a non-monetary item, you feel like, look, Chris ain't got any more money. You know, a, a car, stereo, you know, some non-tangible that indicates I'm tapped out. And then you're going to feel like you got the best deal you could have got. And when you feel like you have the best deal you could have got, you execute. You go through with the deal. The biggest problem with all negotiations is not coming to agreement. It's implementation. Like, we agree to anything. Like I could, I could, um, that microphone. You know, how much, how much you want me to pay you for the microphone? I actually don't know how much this was. <laughs> Pick a number. $300. Okay. Give me the mic. <laughs> Unplug it. See, what you're doing right now is you're getting ready to give me the mic, but you didn't ask me how you were going to get your $300. Because by me giving you your price, you dropped your guard. Oh. You made yourself ridiculously vulnerable to me. I trusted you. You seem very trustworthy. Well, I didn't say I'm not giving you the money. I mean, this is what in in uh, corporate buyouts, in private equity buyouts, in almost all in in the new crypto world, where people are looking for investors, collaborators. They learned a long time ago from the people in in the private capital world, private investment world, given their price. Kill them with the details. This got started 40 years ago with Michael Milken, Carl Icahn, the guys that invented all this stuff, invented the financial world as we exist today. Like the finances around crypto and NFTs and everything going on in Web3, the dynamics of the way money is moved or exploited hasn't changed. And one, and they on Carl Icahn in particular knew that at the price, 65% of the negotiation remained. And that if he gave you the price, you were going to forget about the details because everybody worries about their price. You know, they celebrate victory. They start thinking about how they're spending the money. So ask me, ask me, how are you going to get you $300? How am I going to get my $300? I'm going to give you a dollar a year. 
But you would not have thought to ask me that until after you'd already given me the microphone. Yeah. Because you got your price. Woohoo! Victory! I got my price. Now three hundred. You could have. You could have asked for a million dollars. I'll give you a dollar a year. <laughs> You know, how are you going to get your money? How, how, are you gonna, how are you going to implement the deal is the critical issue in all negotiations. Mm. Now, when I was doing kidnap negotiations, and a kidnapping is a, is a commodities exchange. Kidnapping to us is a horrible thing. Kidnapping to the bad guys, they're dealing in commodities. To win any negotiation, you have to fully understand how the other side sees it and play by their rules in their world and win in their world. So it's a commodity. It's just a commodity exchange. So I could agree to the kidnapper's price, but I wanted to wear them out over the price so that by the time they realized the new implementation had not been worked out, I'm going to have the upper hand on implementation because I want to deliver it in a way that guarantees that the hostage comes out. So they're going to comply with my terms for implementation because they work so hard to get their price. Yeah. I know for, I talk a lot about money on my platforms and for car dealerships, one of their techniques is they get you to that price that you're quite happy with. But then in the details, they add on all of these prices. After you feel like you've won and you're comfortable, they add on extra money for the heated chairs and extra money for these special tires and whatever it is so that ultimately they end up making a lot more money from you. But because that baseline price was where you wanted it, you feel like you've had this big win. Right. And so your guard is down for the fine print when they bring you to the back and say, okay, let's actually sign the paperwork. Human nature is being uh, implemented against us like that all the time. And the sharks that are going to take advantage of you know it. Which is what, and it works because you're not because you're a hostage or because you're an American. And it works because you're a human. And so, get, putting your getting your guard up. How do you protect yourself against people like that? In point of fact, the one thing that I was delighted about the book Tactical Empathy, like I didn't think that the business world was going to be as um, Darwinian across the board, or even t in some cases more Darwinian than um, kidnapping. But the kidnapper negotiator, that, that prototype, is everywhere because it works. So I, I, we put the book out, and I was like, I'm not sure that all the hostage negotiation rules apply across the board. And it does. It does. It does because it's human nature. What about for the real-life scenario? Let's do the car dealership. If you go into a car dealership, how are you, Chris Voss, going to get the lowest price you can possibly get? Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have, I'm probably going to, I will have experimented with a number sum in advance. Um, this is the way I bought my, uh, the Toyota 4Runner that I have and I'm still in love with. I love that car. Love it, love it, love it, love it. <laughs> it's because of its color. First of all, at the time and still today, um, you know, Toyotas last forever. But, and I want, and because of that, and I want a new one. And then I found this, the name of the color is, Salsa red pearl. You know how sexy does that sound? That's it ridiculous, good. right? Yeah. And it is like the sexiest red. And so when I was I shopped the price after I got I got the price to get feedback that it was right. And I was in this one car dealer, and this poor car salesman, this guy was like, you know, like one of these guys that's just like you could tell he's barely hanging on. And so I don't want to waste this dude's time. And I got look, I got a great price. On, on this exact vehicle, and I, I just want to see if you guys can match it. And he says, you got a great price, huh? And I go, yeah, I know, it's ridiculously low. And he says, well, if it's a great price, it's probably around, and it gives me a number, which was two grand higher than what the price I had. So he's then like, but, you know, we, we can make that car for you here. We can match that price. And I say, yeah, but this is, this, this is the sexiest color you ever saw. And this guy goes, well, I don't need a car to make me sexy. <laughs> and, I thought, and I said, you know what? I do. You clearly do not. However, I need all the help that I could get. <laughs> so, but I went in. Um, 
they had they had an they had an opening number. I had a number that I knew was very low from experimentation, and I said, "Look, when the, I, I said you guys' numbers, like this is a beautiful truck." I articulated all of his sales reasons to me. I was in love with the color, I was in love with the brand, I was in love with everything about this truck. So I said that because that's what he's going to say to me. I said, "This is the sexiest thing I've ever seen." I love the color. There isn't an, and on top of that, as you guys know, there are three of them on your lot, and there isn't another one like it for over 100 miles in any direction. I can't go anywhere else and get this vehicle, let alone in this color. And I'm in love with it. I'm in love with this color. You're taking his sales pitch from him. I am. And so then I said, but how am I supposed to pay that price? And he just stared at me and blinked because he didn't know what to say. And so then we're sitting there and he just, and he gets up and he walks away and goes in the back. Now, I know in many cases that's a tactic to make it look like they're talking to the manager and they probably had some latitude to be in with. But he comes back out and he says, hey, all right, so, and they dropped the price by two grand. Now, What's, what's he going to say to me about the price drop? He's going to say it's generous. He's going to say I'm give, he's giving me a great price. So I look at him, I go like, oh, my God, that was so generous. Like, that's, that's I'm, I'm embarrassed. Because it was worth every dime of what you guys were asking. And now you lowered the price. And that was just, it's an even better price. And I love, I love this. It's, 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 I'm going to, I'm going to hate myself. If I don't buy this truck, but how am I supposed to pay that? And he stared at me again and blinked a couple of times and he got up and he went in the back and this time he's gone a really long time and he comes back out with a lower price and a contract all written up and smiley faces on it going, you win, you get your price. Great <laughs> job. I mean, he decorated this baby. And I went and I went and I repeated the whole scenario. And I got him down to the number I was looking for. And then when I got him there, I finally said, you win. And I gave him the price. It's really interesting how the word how is so important in negotiations. You really just flip the script on them. How would I do it for getting a raise at work. Yeah, so how do you succeed at work using what I learned from a drug dealer in Pittsburgh? Because <laughs> that the how question that I originally heard, which then opened my eyes, like sometimes something has to be bothering you for a while before you know that's the answer. In the Burnham case, um, we were told there's an over here a wiretap, and he, you know, one of our hostages is on the phone. And I remember there are a couple of times in, in life that I'm like, it's like short circuits in my brain. Like, first of all, what's one of my hostages doing on the phone? And if they're on the phone, why are they not on my phone? Like, who the hell is, to, are they ordering pizza? Is it, you know, they getting Uber Eats? You know, uh, what the hell's going on? So I'm... Um, still relatively new to the game at the time, I got back to my boss and I said, look, I, I don't know what's going on here, but there's an over here with our hostages on the line. He goes, the only time a hostage is on the phone is to get proof of life. Now my brain is blown again. Number one, who else out there is getting proof of life on my hostages? Secondly, how the hell did they get them on the phone? Like, we never got anybody on the phone. We knew the bad guys weren't going to put them on the phone, so we didn't ask. It's defeating yourself before you make an ask. It's real common human nature response to negotiations. I'm scared it's a non-starter, so I'm not going to bring it out, up, which then means I'm doing your job for you. If I don't even bring it to the table, you're winning. You didn't even have to come to the table. But we do that as human beings because we're scared of getting turned down. When, in fact, there's a whole host of psychological reasons where it's to your advantage to get turned down. But we didn't do it. So the case goes 13 months as a botched rescue attempt at the end. Two out of three of the remaining Americans are killed and the remaining Filipino females killed. 
Again, uh, Gracia outlines it, outlines it in her book, In the Presence of My Enemies. And we talk about it in the documentary. So case is over, and we're figuring out how to get better. Drug dealer on drug dealer kidnapping in Pittsburgh. Drug dealer's girlfriend is grabbed by another drug dealer. Who does everybody go to when somebody in their family gets kidnapped? Even drug dealers come to the FBI for help. So this drug dealer has gone come to the FBI, and the hostage negotiators in Pittsburgh are riding around with him, taping the calls as he's talking to the other bad guy. And on his own, the victim drug dealer says to the, the bad guy drug dealer, victim drug, that's an interesting <laughs> turn of phrase, right? He says, hey, dog, how do I know she's alive? And there's a hesitation on the other end of the phone. And the bad guy, drug dealer, says, I'll put her on the phone. And I went like, that's how it's done. Ask a how question. The, the listener, it feels deferential. And it makes them stop and think and then makes them give you what you want. And that became, we started creating how questions. How am I supposed to do that is the first story in Never Split the Difference and is probably one of the most used phrases in a black swan method. So how do you apply that to your job negotiations? Well, what are the how questions that feel deferential to your boss that are preceded by empathy? Like, remember, I'm, how am I supposed to pay that price with the car dealer? Mm -hmm. Came after I gave him all his reasons for what he wanted. So your boss is, to your boss, your boss wants you to be a team player. You want me to be a team player. You want me to be productive. You want me to produce on behalf of the team. You want me to make everybody look good here. How can I be guaranteed that the projects that I work on will contribute to my career advancement and the advancement of the company? Now, you, gotta, you, gotta, you can't just be me-oriented. Like every employer, every supervisor sees their employees as being basically selfish. Why? Well, they're human beings, and the only time you walk into the boss's office is because you want something. You don't walk into the boss's office going like, hey, you know, just want to make sure, is there anything extra I could do for you today? Nobody says that. When you walk in the door, you've conditioned him or her that you want something for you. So the minute you start asking a how question about how you can make everybody's life better, you know, how can, I be, how can I be involved in stuff that's going to contribute to the advancement of the entire company? Now you're not selfish. Now you're a team player. It's what you say and what they think. You can tell somebody something, and until you've told them 19 times, they don't think it. Boss, I'm a team player. Boss, I want to be a team player. Or you can ask them a great how question, how do I make everybody's life better? And a boss thinks, team player, which now changes the entire negotiation. Yeah. So what I learned from a Pittsburgh drug dealer is to ask the how question deferentially to advance your agenda, as long as you are not the sole beneficiary of the agenda, because you don't want to appear selfish. Did the victim drug dealer have a good outcome? Got the hostage out. Great. Amazing. She went on to run for United States Senate. I'm making that part up. Oh. <laughs> I was like, that's quite a twist. <laughs> She's a lawyer now. Went to Georgetown Law School. Might have been a classmate of yours. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> it's so interesting how this, the word deferential comes up so much in your strategy. Yeah. There's great power in deference. So what is the people that have the upper hand, whether it's the boss that you're asking for a raise from or the kidnapper, what is it that they seek besides its power, obviously? And that's why being deferential to them plays that. Well, I draw a, a distinction between power and influence. Mm. 
And it, there, there might be synonyms, but, you know, power comes to either I have it or if I don't, or how much do I have or how much do they have. Whereas influence is something that you can always impact. And if you're deferential, you get a lot more latitude from um, the person you're trying to influence to influence them if you're deferential. Like one, you know, a favorite example, like wherever you are on a political spectrum these days, and, and I, don't, I don't take a position on politics, but I look at who's influential. Um, one of the most difficult people to influence out there is Donald Trump. And who's the most influential with him? Probably his son-in-law, Jared. Now, Jared's a quiet dude. You know, he doesn't, he, he, he doesn't try to talk about power. He doesn't, he doesn't do things that he knows are going to piss his, sorry, are going to make his father-in-law angry. You know, he's, he's, he's ridiculously, it's clear that he's ridiculously deferential. Who's got the most, I guarantee you that Jared's got more influence on Donald Trump than anybody else on earth. And Jared is ridiculously deferential. So if that's not a great example of the power of deference, I mean, if it works there, it works everywhere because it works with people. Mm. So it puts you in a position to influence. And you get a lot done. Like, does it work every time? No, it just works more than anything else does. And that's what you want. Best chance of success. See, and, and, and the whole deference issue is, um, you see, most of the great negotiators have it. Not all. I mean, um, but most. And again, you're looking for best chance of success. They learn that deference doesn't make people mad. They learn that they get farther with deference. They learn that it's more effective and it's more powerful. And so most of the bad negotiation advice, the whole issue out there are between men and women negotiation dynamics. Like one I, I used to get asked all the time is do women get penalized for negotiating? Well, they get penalized more than men do for bad negotiating. And I don't teach bad negotiation, so that's not my problem. And so some of the bad negotiation advice is, you know, be powerful, have a strong voice. You know, uh, just like deference, there, people are, some people... The bad negotiation advice fears deference the way a vampire might feel fear sunlight. Like, ah, I can't do that. I'm going to die. When point of fact, the people that really succeed are extremely deferential. Warren Buffett, uh, you ever hear that guy talk? Like, he's not loud. He's not pushy. Not a, he's, he's very quiet. He's, he's very deferential. He's very downward inflecting. Like, nobody talks about, I negotiated with Warren Buffett, and boy, did he beat me up. Nobody says that mm -hmm. about him dealing with them or watching them, like the, the power and deference. But most of the examples are loud men. So as women have come up through and are getting farther in the business world every day, <clears throat> vast majority of their examples of bad negotiators are loud, pushy people. And what I love about today's business environment, like I'm a last century guy. So last century, as women were coming up through the ranks, they were taught to act like men, and it just consumed them. Uh, law enforcement started advancing women probably faster than the business world did, and women are coming up through the FBI ranks, and I just watch it destroy their spirit because they're told to be one of the guys and to be a man and cut their hair and not wear makeup and not be feminine. But this is from people who aren't that good at what they're doing. They just nobody knows it because there isn't anybody that's that good at it. In today's world, women are not afraid to be feminine. And it is part of success. And so they don't have to be like a man to succeed. And so I could be deferential and powerful. Men are scared to be deferential. Successful negotiators are not afraid of it. And so as, as women you know, hang on to the best parts of themselves and avoid the bad parts of male behavior. Deference is, I don't, I don't hear people being worried about being deferential as much as I used to, particularly from women, because it it's a powerful thing to be. Yeah. And it's but very, it's subtle, it's quiet. It has to be. Because when a man is very vocal about how he feels, it will be labeled as confidence. When a woman like me does it, it will be labeled as aggression. Right. It's Erica is so aggressive. Right, right. Or, you know, they're going to they're gonna call you the B word, right? Mm -hmm. Behind your back. 
But what people also don't see, you know, that, that male aggressor who looked like he got the deal in the moment created so much friction that the implementation of the deal was an ugly train wreck. And nobody ever wanted to deal with him again. Like people put themselves out of business by being aggressive. Because even if you get your deal, all the people that you dealt with are so wounded by it that they won't fight you again. They just won't deal with you again. Or they're going to they're gonna nickel and dime you in terms and conditions. Or they're going to be add-ons or cost overruns or change orders or any of the places that you need the latitude after you thought you had a deal which is where the money is really made or lost, somebody that you beat up in an aggressive fashion is not going to give you anything. You're going to pay dearly for everything. So the person who looked very successful by being loud and aggressive, then suddenly the deals go away or the deals don't get con What happened to that deal? I, you know, I don't know. I don't, I don't know. You know, they, they never implemented it or... You know, they killed us in terms and conditions. It never came out of terms and conditions. Yeah. Like there's a thousand and one ways for people to pay you back if you're loud and aggressive in the room. And they will pay you back. So how do you make sure that with negotiations, you're getting to a situation where both parties do feel like they've won at the end of it? Well, um, take your time in a process. Delays that save time because where you really lose time is in implementation. If people feel respected and heard, They'll give you what you want. Their real issue was, do they feel hurt? Do they feel respected? Did they participate in the process? Then they're vested in the process. Did they get a chance to speak? Did they get a chance to lay out what they wanted? The other idea why you want them to lay out what they want is they're going to have a good idea that you could use. They're going to. The more you get them talking, the more likely that's going to come up. And... If you're the one making the pitch, if you're the one explaining, if even if your value proposition is dead on, you haven't found out what their great idea was that could make you even more money. And then they get to contribute an idea that's a spectacular idea. Now they're even more determined to make things work out because now they're emotionally invested in the process. Jim Camp wrote a book in 2002 called Start With No. And he talked about getting people invested in the process. He called it driving their budget. The more invested they are, the more likely they are to consummate the deal. And he arbitrarily gave the different elements like a 1x, 2x, 3x, 4x amount that they invest. And you're going for the stuff where they're 4x in investment. The 4x is emotions. The 1x is dollars. Like people can walk away do from dollars faster than they can walk away from their time. And he put time in as 2x. And I don't recall what the 3x was because the 4x jumped out at me so much. Emotional investment. That is the heaviest influencer. Emotional investment. And I remember reading that book thinking, wow. Hostage negotiators with empathy, now in the black swan method, tactical empathy, is all about getting the other side emotionally invested in the deal. And Camp says that it's a 4x rate of return. And money's only the 1x. All right, let's go for the emotional investment. With everything that you've learned, how are you implementing all of these negotiation tactics and the emotional investment into what you're doing every day constantly and got to practice it constantly also because we got nine skills essentially and each one of them is perishable which means if you don't get some practice in when tomorrow comes i'm going to be worse you're going to be worse if you don't practice principle wants to practice on a regular basis or what we refer to as no oriented questions like where take your question where you're looking for a yes and just switch it to a no Instead of saying, have you got a few minutes to talk, is now a bad time to talk. Instead of saying, do you mind if I pr propose an idea, I say, are you against me sharing an idea? It's real simple. Do you agree becomes do you disagree? Is this a good idea? 
becomes, is this a bad idea? Or are you against? Just constantly, constantly, constantly. And I never ask an important question that's, I'm looking for yes. I'm always looking for no. And, you know, I, I get practice constantly, every day. I got to stay in practice. The other thing I got to do is I got to stay in practice is getting a read on your emotional state. Looks like it's been a good day. Looks like it's been a long day. Looks like it's been a medium day. And people that I run across, I don't even got to get it right. I just need to practice. I'm rolling through TSA in, a, in an airport. I fly every week, so and TSA are frequent unwitting victims of my negotiation practice. <laughs> And I'll, th- I'll throw out an observation because, like, these people, TSA people are getting beat up right and left. So, and, and you can see from the look on their face what's going on. And I'm, I, I, I've always got a Voss water bottle with me. And half the time I forget to drink the water. And I, I don't want them to throw the bottle away because it's Voss water. So it's I got to negotiate the release of my water bottle without going back out to the curb and starting over. But I happen to get through TSA this day. And uh, I met the guy who's where your bags, the guys where your bags come out. And I realized I hadn't thrown, uh, uh, you know, uh, a cold read, a verbal observation on anybody's mindset. So he had an indifferent look on his face. He didn't look like it was a bad day. But I say, tough day? And he kind of goes, no. And I go, just another day. And he goes, yeah. So I wasn't afraid to make a mistake. I just threw out a label in a, in a quick succession. I went to a go-to label because it's almost always a tough day for TSA guys mm-hmm. and gals. And I was wrong. And it was okay that I was wrong. And I adapted in the moment. And I got it right. And then I got the reaction I was looking for. Which is, wow, you understand me. Yeah, yeah you get, I feel seen. And he felt better in the moment. I don't know what neurochemical he got a hit of in the moment. It was probably serotonin, but he felt better. So 15 minutes later, I'm in the middle of a negotiation that I did not plan. But it was a guy that I needed to speak to. And I'm in one of the uh, airline lounges and I'm on the phone with this guy. And off the top of my head, I hit him with a combination of a label and a no oriented question, and he immediately gives me what I want. And if I hadn't gotten into practice with the TSA guy 15 minutes earlier, I wouldn't have been warmed up for the negotiation I didn't expect to be in 15 minutes later. Mm. And that, that's why those, those two things, practicing labeling people, label their, you can label somebody's emotion you got a pretty good idea of the look on their face or their body language. And then if they open their mouth, their tone of voice. But you, you continue to get that practice in, and then I'm always doing no oriented questions because I never know when I'm going to be in the middle of a negotiation that matters to me. So I got to, you know, it's, you got to stay loose. Yeah. And it's also interesting that uh, of the labeling emotions, you didn't go for great day. Are you having a great day? Most people won't say no and go on to their life story about why they're having a bad day. So it's interesting to go from the bad day first. Well, I'm not trying to induce. People do that all the time. They're trying to induce you into a great mood, trying to rescue you. They're trying to save you. And that's a good strategy. But the tactic doesn't work. Like somebody's going to be annoyed if they're having a bad day and you go, great day? Well, in in their head, they're going to be like, well, you don't see me. That's what you say to everybody. So that means you're fake. Because that isn't based on anything I'm giving you. So you just told me you're fake. You know, you hit me with the the thing that you say to everybody. And I kind of resent it. Yeah. Did you rescue your water from TSA? Ha! Not only, I have never lost a water bottle to TSA. I've had varying degrees of success. The last time, um, I didn't have to go back through security at all. Uh, you know, the, They just make you drink it? 
after security? She well, I just said, I, 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 you know, how much? That's I can't throw it out. How am I supposed to throw out my medication? I got medication in a bottle. And the the lady, and it wasn't the best I'd ever done. I mean, my, my tone of voice had gotten a little out of control. I got a little, you know, uh, annoyed. But she goes, it's medication? I go, yeah. Which, in point of fact, was true. I mean, vitamins are medication. Mm-hmm. And I take a ton of vitamins. And she goes, okay, keep going. And I'm like, <laughs> just go? And she goes, yeah. <laughs> I'm like, all right, I'm out of here. I needed you a few weeks ago. My toothpaste these days is always getting confiscated because it's too large. And you, Well, you're probably buying really good toothpaste too, right? It's crust, but with inflation, it's gotten quite expensive. <laughs> <laughs> like, what do they do with the toothpaste that they confiscate? They give it to homeless people? Like, are there some... I don't think so. I think they just throw it all throw away. It That's horrible. It's devastating. And all the sunscreens and everything. Right, right. <laughs> So when's the last time you can remember that you were stumped, that the negotiated the negotiation didn't go the way you wanted, you raised your voice or whatever it is? Um, I'm, I'm sure that happens all the time. There's rarely a time that I don't get another crack at it. In, even if things are going bad, one of the most compelling rules of human nature and negotiation is the last impression is a lasting impression. So even if it's going bad, I'll find a way to leave the door open positively so that either you're going to initiate revisiting it with me or I'm good revisiting it with you. Like I, I'm, I, I, I ended positively so I can get back with you. What's an empathy approach going to look like? If it went bad last time, you're probably going to think I'm a jerk. So I'm going to start with that. Like, you know, it ended badly last time. You probably think I'm a jerk. Is it a ridiculous idea for us to share a few more ideas on this? That's a, an observation. It's empathy and a no oriented question. And, I, you know, I can't think of anything off the top of my head, but I know it happens on a regular basis. I get what I want a lot, but I don't get everything. So, yeah, sometimes it goes bad, and I either walk away and move on or... I give myself 24, 48 hours. The only way you can't go back through the door is if you ended negatively, like parting shots, you know, cheap shot last words, famous last words. The thing I wish I would have said to put them in their place. With my husband, it's, I knew I was right. That's my last word. <laughs> <laughs> I'm always right. <laughs> of course you are. For you then? What That's what are... he was telling me earlier. He <laughs> said, thank always. God, thank God she's always right. I'm such a lucky man. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> what about for you in your lifetime? What was the most important negotiation? Wow. I don't know. If we make a deal, I'm into implementation. Like the, the negotiation over the book. You know, Never Split the Difference is a collaboration between myself, my son, un, who's an uncredited co-author, Brandon, my son Brandon, and Tal Raz. And we gave Tal what he asked for. And I broke it through my agent. But we were going to implement the heck out of it. Like, Tal gets, Tal, Tal Ra is a brilliant writer. I mean, for business negotiation books, there is not a better business negotiation book writer on earth. And his results prove it. Like, he's always been a collaborator on business books, and everything he touches is either a New York Times bestseller or Wall Street Journal bestseller or both. So that was a really important negotiation. I'm not going to quibble with him on what his end is. People don't deliver if you quibble on what their end is. Mm. And he delivered. He, he, he wrote a brilliant book. And I didn't quibble with the agent. And with the publisher, you know, we went back and forth on the terms. I didn't quibble on the terms. I just checked with people that I knew were familiar with the terms because I wasn't. And I asked both my agent and Tall, here are the terms. Are these in line? Because I don't want to quibble with the publisher either. I don't, I don't want them feeling resentful over what they paid or any of the terms. That was probably one of the more important negotiations. 
Um, so we try really hard to make the deal with whoever we talk to. We generally make the deal or leave them in a position where if it comes back up, they're willing to revisit it. So, and if you negotiate in a black swan method, like he, and this is why this is hard for me to answer this. Our clients, people that we coach and train, we hear from somebody every week, this deal is going to change my life. Every week. And if you told me that this week, chances are in two or three months, you're going to make another life-changing deal. So you're making life-changing deals nearly quarterly. And so then if somebody would have said, what was the most important one? You'd be like, wow, I got a long list of things that worked out great because I took this approach or that other opportunities fell in my lap because people talked about the fact they made money with me or that I was easy to deal with. Nobody's out, nobody's out there bad-mouthing a black swan group for dealing with us. Like even the people we don't make deals with. They're like, well, we didn't make a deal, but we didn't mind talking to them. Or nobody's out there going like, Black Swan Group, God, those guys, God, they killed us. They just, nobody says that about us. Because we got a great product and we over-deliver and we're nice about it. We're not pushovers. Nobody, nobody's bragging about pushing us over either. Nobody. Yeah. So we're really nice and we're not pushovers. For these business deals, do you think you're sacrificing some monetary value by trying to play nice in a sense? Well, um, I'm, you know, what's your return on investment? What I'm looking for is a great return on implementation and on repu reputation and livelihood. I'm going to want you to over deliver. So if I quibble with you over dollars, you're not going to over deliver. So, I don't worry about the monetary satisfaction or uh, loss. I worry about the implementation issues and reputational issues. And dollars are cheap investments for long-term growth. If someone negotiates with you, what three words do you want them to walk away from the negotiation describing you as? They're probably reasonable. And people are going to describe you as reasonable if you hurt them out. Um, if you didn't beat them up, you know, you, you, your, your demeanor was pleasant. And then also, that's going to be a characterization of the stuff that you wanted. Because people are going to give you reasonable stuff. So reasonable sort of is this all-encompassing uh, description of your demeanor, how they felt treated, and what they gave you. They're not going to resent what they gave you if you were reasonable. They're going to say, well, yeah, you know, it's a reasonable price. Or those are, those are reasonable conditions. Or, you know, it's reasonable that we pay them when they want to get paid. Like, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of businesses, you know, used to be, you know, we get a 2% discount if we pay within 30 days. Or, you know, if we... If we pay timely after delivery, you're going to make me pay less, mm -hmm. which runs into a whole host of problems. Like we take half up front and we don't, and we, all, every dime with us is non-refundable. We, and now it's evergreen, which means, and I did a keynote speech, um, that we had contracted for before the pandemic. And they gave us 50% down up front, the balance on delivery, not 30 days after delivery, balance on delivery. So we're going into the pandemic that, you know, the, the phrase that's in every contract now, the, which I can't pronounce, which is Latin, like force mob or, you know, like acts of oh, God. Oh, force majeure. Force majeure, yeah, thank you. You're a lawyer, right? You know how yeah. to say that stuff. <laughs> Force majeure. That wasn't in the contracts back then. We took half up front. It was evergreen. Like I'm delivering a keynote three years later for the same price. And our prices are significantly higher now. But this is what we agreed to three years ago. And I showed up and over-delivered because that's what we agreed to. 
So you're you're gonna pay me the money, and we didn't refund it. Either. Pandemic, that's not my problem. But when we deliver, we're gonna so over deliver that you'll be like, I was worth waiting for. The Black Swan Group was reasonable. Everything they asked for was reasonable. We want half up front. We want the balance on delivery. We're going to knock it out of the park when we show up, and it's going to be the cheapest money you ever spent. We're reasonable. Reasonable. What are the other two words you think? Probably sincere. Mm. Because sincerity is honesty. And sincerity is, like, I could hear you out and completely and really never talk about myself at all. And, you're, and as long as I'm sincerely interested, um, you're going to want to deal with me again. And I am sincerely interested. But I'm not like, I won't say, I'm a nice guy. I really care about you. You know, we really want to see you do well. I don't have to express any of it. So I think sincere is probably going to be a good descriptor also. Mm. And then I'm, I'm tempted, uh, I want to say um, integrity. And, you know, is there a difference between sincerity and integrity? There probably is. But you deal with people with in integrity. Uh, people want to deal with you again. What do people say about you? Integrity. I mean, you want a reputation that precedes you in a way that brings you business. You want opportunities to fall out of the sky. If I have a reputation of being reasonable, sincere, and having integrity, when we have a disagreement, you're probably going to actually listen to me because of my reputation. Or you're going to be willing to approach me. You're also going to be willing to trust me. And because with those attributes, I'm also going to be a great ambassador for you. Yeah. I recently got approached by a very high profile person in the entertainment industry and, um, try and wanting to do business with me. They looked at my negotiation videos and being honest and upfront and not lying in negotiations and over delivering is in all of my presentations and every keynote that I give in all of our negotiation training. They, with no prior relationship, they approached me out of the blue wanting to do business. I think sincerity, integrity, reasonableness attracts those sorts of opportunities to you. Yeah. And with, and with the people that value that stuff. Now, do sharks take a pass at us every now and then? Yeah, but we smell the sharks coming and we don't make the deal. I give you a chance to prove if you're a shark in real short order or snake or rat or whatever sort of predatory behavior there is. Some of it is backstabbing. Some of it is coming right at you. And then I will take you at, based on your behavior at who you are. And then either we make the deal or we don't. And if you're... I, a lot of our negotiation training is designed to sniff out the bad deals in the first half hour. And then we walk. It's not a sin to not get the deal. It's a sin to take a long time to not get the deal. It's also a sin to take a long time to get a bad deal. So if there are indicators of it up front, and there are, learn what those are. And best chance of success, rely on the indicators and move on. How much of what you are today as a negotiator, do you think comes from your years and years of experience versus something that you just intuitively have in you, the inability to read people? Is it nature or is it nurture? Yeah. Yeah. I think the vast majority of it is nurture. It's not nature. There's a book out there by Daniel Coyle called The Talent Code. It's a great book on getting better, how to improve your own talents. And Coyle pretty much contends that everything is learned. And that those that seem to be naturals just got interested and started learning before anybody realized. You know, the whole 10,000 hour thing. Uh, they, they started their 10,000 hours before anybody else ever noticed. And I'm, I'm about 98% on board with that. Like, um, uh, I think great songwriter, uh, music producer, David Foster. I think he spotted a note famously on his, that somebody was cleaning and cleaning a piano when he was three and they had, they had a key and he called out what key it was. Yeah, he's probably born with some talent. But by and large, he had to nurture that. You know, he had to, he had to go after it. He had to, 
I think he's Canadian. He, he comes to Los Angeles, and he just starts hanging out in studios and playing and playing and playing and playing and playing and playing his piano. And he'd be in sessions and just start playing and jamming. He said, people come and go. They go get something to eat. They go out, they out, go out and get high. He'd still, his, he'd still be in there playing and playing and playing. He put in the time. Yeah. But there must be something. I imagine the FBI doesn't want just anyone to be an FBI hostage negotiator. And they take you and they say, oh, no problem. We'll train you on the job. What about you stood out to the FBI? Yeah. Did I take initiative? And was I simultaneously, did I take direction? Um, that's what made me stand out. You can take direction and not take initiative. You can take initiative and not take direction. And, or you can take direction from the wrong people. You know, never take advice from somebody you wouldn't trade places with. Never take advice from somebody, directions from somebody who hasn't been where you're going. So I would s seek out the people that knew what they were talking about. I would take their advice and then I would take initiative. And that really made me jump out. And then, which means if I screwed up, the people weren't afraid to, con to continue to give me further direction because I listened. Mm -hmm. Now, n did I listen right away? I get, I get told to spontaneously show up for hostage negotiations regardless of whether or not I was called. And after I'd been given that advice, the second time I failed to take it, the person who gave it to me was like, I told you to show up, just show up. And both times I failed to show up, I missed out in a really big way. Then in uh, what ended up being like the unicorn event, which was a bank robbery with hostages, uh, which if I can shamelessly refer to the documentary again, we talk about in the documentary Tactical Empathy. I showed up un, un, unasked. I was sitting in the office, uh, New York office, the FBI one day, and one of my colleagues, Charlie, came up to me and said, there's a bank robbery in Brooklyn with hostages. Let's go. And we went, and we just showed up. And I had missed out in a big way on two previous instances, and to this day I'm annoyed at myself for not showing up for those. We showed up. A bank robbery with hostages happens in New York City once every 20 years. Bank robberies where the hostages are held and still there when the police show up. Hostages get taken in banks all the time, but the bad guys know the police are on the way and they're out of there. So to actually trap bank robbers in a bank and have an actual real life hostage negotiation take place, it won't happen in the United States this year. It probably hasn't happened in this entire country in the last five years. Like, it just doesn't happen. It's such a rare event. And because I'd gotten burned previously, we, Charlie and I showed up. And I ended up being the second negotiator on the phone. And I got the first bank robber to surrender to surrender to me in a face-to-face -face surrender outside the bank. And that ended up being career-changing. Because then I could... I took the initiative to create a case study on, on the bank robbery. Mm -hmm. And this is before any of the presentation tools exist today. So I went back to the bank and I took pictures with a camera. And then I had the pictures made into slides in the old slide machines that we used to have. And then I took a bunch of pictures and I threw together an entire presentation. Because the guys that were in charge of the negotiation unit encouraged me to do so but didn't tell me to. They wanted to see if I would take the initiative. Took direction, took initiative. There's going to be further direction after you take the, the initiative. Are you embarrassed because you did it right, wrong? Are you um, uh, suddenly entitled and prideful because you did it right? You got to continue to take direction. And you got to continue to take initiative. And I took direction and I took initiative. And it led to some pretty cool stuff. So how did the guy, how did you get this bank robber to surrender face-to-face -to, -face to you? Negotiations had been going on for about five hours. NYPD hostage negotiator was the first guy on the phone. I was his coach. NYPD lieutenant was running the team after about five hours of stalemate. But a lot of instinctive information had been gathered. The lieutenant 
looks at me and says, Chris, you're on the phone next. Joe, you're off. Chris, you're on. Chris is what I want you to do. And I followed the direction, uh, which was counter to my training, but I take direction. So I folded the different direction into my training. He wanted me, very, uh, me to be more assertive, but I can be very assertive in a really nice way. Downward inflecting voice. Bad guys got rattled on the inside. Uh, their counter move was first, out of the blue, put a hostage on the phone. Uh, secondly, they swapped negotiators too. So the second guy, completely different mindset than the first guy, he's listening to me. He's not as manipulative as the other guy. Literally 90 seconds in to our conversation, based solely on my tone of voice, because I hadn't had a chance to do much more in 90 seconds, he says to me, I trust you. So we're listening. We're trying to get him to let a hostage go. And because I take direction, somebody else on the team, they got a gut instinct that this guy might want to come out. So he, they write it on a note. They hand it to me. I'm sitting there on the phone. I get a note, and I say, note says, ask him to come out. So I just do a 180 from trying to get a hostage out. I say, why don't you come out? And there's this long silence on the other end of the phone. And the guy goes, I don't know how I'd do that. Which is a great big giant yes. Yeah. Like if you can lay this out for me, I'm coming out. So I got to find out what he's worried about. How he sees himself coming out. And in point of fact, what this guy's most worried about is he's afraid of getting beaten badly when he comes out. Now, one of the reasons he's afraid of getting beaten badly is because he and his colleague had beaten the female bank tellers. Only we don't know this at the time. Mm -hmm. But he knows already that his colleague hit one of them in the head with a gun. So he's worried. He, you know, he doesn't know. NYPD's got a reputation, earned or unearned, but he's got plenty of reason for being worried about taking a beating when he comes out. So that's what he's mostly worried about. So we go back and forth and back and forth, and I'm working on him, and I'm demonstrating understanding. I'm getting him closer and closer and closer. I'm, I'm not perfect. At one point in time, when I overdid it, he says, hey, you don't have to school me. So I'm like, all right, I can make a mistake. No big deal. But I'm working on him, and finally somebody, I get another note that says, tell him you meet him outside. And I said, are you ready to meet me outside? And he goes, yeah, I'm ready to end this shit. And jumped through the hoops I needed to jump through, went outside, and uh, got on the loudspeaker and talked him out of the bank. One of the exercises you did as a professor at USC that I've heard amazing things about is you would role play with your students. Right. To see if they've actually absorbed the negotiation training that you've given to them. Can we attempt that? Are you talking about 60 seconds or she dies? Yes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> of course we can. Okay. Do you want to? All right. So sh I should lay it out with the premise. Yes, so, please. But, all right. So one of us going to be a bank robber. One of us going to be a hostage negotiator. The information about the bank robber is that uh, you don't know how many bank robbers. You don't know how many hostages. All you know is the negotiators got to talk the bank robber out. Four restrictions. The bank robber cannot be given weapons. Number one. Number two, no transportation. Number three, no drugs or alcohol. Number four, no exchange of hostages, which means nobody comes in, people only come out. So no transportation, no weapons, no drugs or alcohol, no exchanges of hostages. And then one of us will be the bank robber, the other will be the hostage negotiator. You could be whichever one you want. I'll be the negotiator. Okay. So we'll simulate being over the phone. And so when you're ready, you know, you... As we like to say, hostage negotiators are the ultimate cold calling salesman. Okay. So you got to cold call the bank. Okay. <laughs> ring, ring. I need a car in 60 seconds or she dies. Wait, you say we're already on the phone? We are on the phone. Okay. You I need, need a, a, a car. car in 60 seconds or she dies. Sorry. Can we start one more time? I just got no, no, don't no. laugh at no, me. No, no, no. The cam is rolling. Okay, fine, fine. How do you expect me to get that car to you? Put the car out front. Leave the keys in it. 
get all get all those morons and their tactical gear out of the way, leave the door open, get out of the way. I can't make that happen in 60 seconds, but I will try my best to get that car for you. So you can give me the car. It's just a matter of time. I will try my best. No, 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 there ain't no try here. I will try my best to not kill this hostage in 50 seconds. How about that? How do you want me to coordinate to get everyone on my side on board for this plan? How much time do you need? I need at least five minutes. Okay, call me back in five minutes. If it's not ready, then I'm going to kill the hostage. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so I bought five minutes. <laughs> all right, so let's go through a couple of those things real quick. Okay. So first of all, like when I gave you 60 seconds until I cited 50 seconds was a lot longer than 10 seconds. So you, your dead silence, your dynamic silence at the beginning uh, also, in your instance, your stunned silence. But it wasn't a bad thing. Like, there can, if, there can be a lot raging on the inside. If when in doubt, if you just go dead silent, it, there's a very good chance that that's going to be a positive in the dynamic. So, if I come at you with a demand in any type of negotiation... And you respond like that, I'm going to think, all right, she's thinking about it. I, I made my point. I, I needed to say it forcibly so my point would be made. So I'm already winning if you're thinking about it. So silence is one of the most powerful tools in negotiation. And two out of three people are not comfortable with it. Um, you know, as an example, I'm listening to Barbara Corcoran uh, about almost two years ago now when Clubhouse was really big. She and I are both on the same talk about negotiation. And she said, here's a phrase that I've never regretted uttering. Give me some time to think about it, which effectively is give me some time to go silent. Give me some time to not respond. And I remember thinking like is experienced and as savvy a business person as Barbara Corcoran is, for her to say, I've never regretted saying, give me some time to think about it, is powerful. Never is a pretty broad word. So basically, give me some time to be silent. is powerful, and you were silent. Now, part of why it was a stunned silence on your part was your neurochemical response to my direct and honest voice. And those of us that are natural-born assertives, which is about a third of the planet, we think of ourselves as just direct and honest. And so in our mind, I'm actually doing you a favor by being direct and honest. But the negotiation is about the impact it has on the recipient. And this forceful response actually interferes with the recipient's ability to think. It's a neurochemical reaction. It's not a psychological reaction. You, you, your ability to think is not influenced by the fact that, you know, whatever psychological state you have, whatever psychologist, however they would categorize you as. It's not a psychological reaction. It doesn't have anything to do with your gender, your ethnicity, your diet, nothing. A neurochemical reaction is because you're human. And there's a neurochemical response to an aggressive voice that actually makes you dumber. It locks your brain up. Mm. And so that's another reason why when somebody's coming at you hard, you might go silent. But as long as you don't show it on the exterior, if you maintain your poise, you don't got to say anything. And you did all of that in your response. Now, I know from my tone of voice, I know that my tone of voice is counterproductive. So I know that's what's going on with you. But... You, then what you didn't do was you didn't lose control to it. Like you got your feet back under you and you started to ask me a couple of really good how questions. Now the how am I supposed to do that question, the reason I came at you back at you that hard with it is because it's probably the most used in an effective manner mm -hmm. phrase from Never Split the Difference. How am I supposed to do that? And nine out of ten times... The other side, it is a game changer completely in that moment. 
nine out of ten times, in the one in ten, your counterpart's going to throw it right back at you. Mm -hmm. And it has worked so well so many times. Like we hear, I from clients all the time. I heard a woman on, on in one conversation said, I used, how am I supposed to do that? And it didn't work. And I said, okay, so how, what makes you say it didn't work? Now, number one, the reason she said it is because she'd been using it to great effect. And she'd gotten, she dropped her guard because she was so used to it being so successful that when she got a different response, she said it didn't work. And what she got back was pretty much what I gave you. Somebody told her exactly how to do it. And I said, all right, so it's not that it didn't work. It's that you got an answer you were unprepared for. Those are two different things. Data improves the design. The design that you just got back is the other side thinks this is the implementation and doesn't care how hard it is for you. That gives you a lot of great information about your counterpart. It's not information that you hope for. But it's solid. Mm. You now know you're dealing with someone who doesn't really care how hard it is for you. They're not really interested in your success. This is not a great long-term partner. You can make a deal with this person, but don't kid yourself out of whether or not you got a tiger by the tail. There's no problem with having a tiger by the tail. The problem is trying to kid yourself into thinking it's a pussycat. You got a tiger by the tail, fine. Or whatever analogy you want. Some people talk about scorpions. A scorpion's going to sting you between the shoulders if you let the scorpion on your back. Don't let him on your back. It's a scorpion. So there's, no wrong, there's nothing wrong with dealing with that sort of uh, archetype. Unless you kid yourself about what you're dealing with. Just eyes open. Do you recall a student who went through that exercise that really stunned you in the way that they were able to respond? Well, it was, it was a rigged game. And it was a, a businessman who'd been briefed in advance by somebody who'd been through the exercise and said, volunteer and do nothing but ask him how and what questions. And just be relentless. How am I supposed to do that? What's going to happen if I do? What do you want me to do? What are the next steps? How am I supposed to do that? What's going to happen when I do? What do you want me to do? Like an endless loop. Now, the reason why this guy did this, and I didn't know it was a rigged game at the time, he'd had a previous negotiation. He was a hospital administrator, and doctors are divas. And doctors, they go to whoever's going to pay them the most money to bring the, their surgical skills to that hospital. Like, you're a great knee doctor, you're constantly marketing out, you know, hospital, how much are you going to pay me to do my orthopedic surgeries in your hospital? And the ones that are real divas, they're like professional athletes who want to renegotiate their contract every five minutes. So this, this guy's a hospital administrator. He's got a diva doctor that's coming in demanding more money every other week. And my buddy who'd been trained said, when this doctor comes in, just ask the guy how and what questions until he gets exhausted and leaves your office. And he said, I, 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 that's never going to work. And this guy was his boss and said, you know what? Do it because I told you to. Doctor comes in. He, how and what questions? Doctor finally gets worn out and walks away with no, without getting more money. And this guy goes, that was great. Where'd you learn that? Well, when you go into the Black Swan training, they're going to do 60 seconds so she dies. You volunteer. And Chris... Just ask him how and what questions. And this guy starts hitting me with how and what and how and what and how and what. And finally, about four minutes in, I go like, wow, okay. All right, all right, all right, all right. I give, I quit. And then we finished the exercise with two more people. And he met me out in the hall and he says, you know, you were set up. And I'm like, okay. He said, Randy told me to volunteer and what to do. <laughs> and the reason I knew what to do is because I'd used it against the doctor and it had it work. So that was the only time anybody ever really got me. Rigged. <laughs> Set me up. I'm curious about your career now and what you want to accomplish. Because most people after this long career at the FBI would dream of going to retire on a beach in Hawaii. 
But that's not what you did. You've created the book, you've created Black Swan, you've done all of these things. What's in the future for you that you're excited about? And why did you decide to create this different path? Because it's fun. It's exciting. It's interesting. We're plowing new ground. And the Black Swan Method, we're talking about stuff right now that we hadn't even discovered a year ago. We're constantly applying it, constantly evolving it, learning more and more business situations and scenarios and the tweaks. So it's a lot of fun. And as I said, it's gratifying when somebody says to you, this deal is going to change my life. Like not only is it going to change their life, but by definition, when somebody says that, they didn't beat the other side. They, didn't, they don't come to us and say, I killed them. They say, it's going to change my life. And then we know it works globally. The book sells well in China. It sells well in India. It's in 36 countries and 33 languages. And it's not being used to negotiate with Americans in China. It's Chinese negotiating with Chinese. Like I, I had a woman come up to me. I was in Dubai last year. And she said, I use your book all the time. And I said, I, I know it's going to sound stupid. You're Chinese, right? She goes, yeah. I go, you live in China, right? She goes, yeah. And I go, so the people you negotiate with are Chinese, right? She goes, yeah. I go, I just want to make sure. Because <laughs> that's what I thought you were telling me. But so it's everywhere. So we just, we want to coach globally. We're principally operating, training and coaching principally, not exclusively in the United States. I think the world is improved by better business practices. Um, don't expect governments to fix your problems. I, somebody once described to me, expect your government to be a referee, which means you're not going to win the game. They're just going to try to keep down the number of times people are cheating you. But then it's up to you to make the world a better place. And better business practices creates jobs, creates better livelihoods, creates better futures, puts kids in better schools, puts families in better houses. So do that on a global scale. And you have your documentary. Documentary, Tactical Empathy, just got finished. We've got it entered in Sundance. I don't know if it's going to get into Sundance. We're probably going to show it there one way or the other. And it really um, shows how the method evolved from some of the hostage negotiation cases, Chase Manhattan Bank's in there, that it evolved from. We're also touching on how we can take this full circle and help solve some police minority community relations problems by helping cops be better trained. I'm curious, when you launched your Never Split the Difference book, did you expect it to be such a success? Because that you were a first-time author, correct? Right, right. No, nobody did. Like, no, no, literally nobody did. Like, first of all, my agent, great guy, Steve Ross, the reason I worked with him was like, I don't know. He said, I don't know how much the U.S. publishers are going to go, but books with FBI in them sell like crazy overseas. Overseas, they got a huge appetite for any sort of instruction from the FBI. So I know I can sell this well overseas. So I'm like, all right, cool. And then he put it out to the American publishers, and they instantly went nuts over it. There was a feeding frenzy. So we had an auction. And they still didn't think it was going to do that well. Like nobody thought, I was told early on, the book will stop selling. It's going to fall off a cliff. You know, ideally it sells well for about six months, and then it's going to fall off a cliff. And, and then you're just going to have to keep working. It never fell off a cliff. Like I checked... On Amazon today, it, it, it's number one and number two in the business negotiation category. And then in the different versions and languages it's in, it's in nine of the top 22 spots in the business category. Almost half the top spots in the business category is my book in English, Kindle, Audible, Spanish, Spanish, Audible, and then in sort of a weird twist, the, the British publisher published it in paperback. So the hardcover is still selling extremely well and the soft cover is selling. And for whatever reason, uh, the second run of the soft cover, they change colors and both colors are selling well. Wow. Like it is all over the place. Like everybody in the world is reading the book still to this day. I have to ask a very lawyer question. 
How did it work with the confidentiality? Did the FBI have to sign off on the book? Yep. Or? Yeah. They did. The FBI's pre-publication review was something I knew in advance. I was ready for it. As it turned out, it went very quickly and very smoothly. Like I thought they were going to, you know, kill me with red tape. They promised to turn around in 30 days or less. They turned around in two weeks. They told me the problems. Problems were simple tweaks. I told them I fixed the problems, which I had. They didn't verify my word on anything. I think it was the way I dealt with them and my reputation for integrity. Simple things like I needed to get permission. And certain individuals had never been linked publicly to certain incidents. And they said, everything that you've got out in, in the book is in public domain. We got no reason to get in the way, except you named this person. This person has not been publicly linked. You have to have their permission. I went back and got permission from everybody. And I said, I got, I got the permissions of all the players. How do you want me to let you know? Email, what do you, what do you need? Letters, what do you need? And I go, you're good to go. And so the pre-publication review, they reviewed every word. And every word has been reviewed by the FBI. And they raised no objections. Wow. You think they use it for training now in the FBI? No, they don't. But the unit, the crisis negotiation unit, that I was in, I just got invited back to speak to them after all this time because the first thing the people that replace you have to prove is that they're capable of doing the job, which means they don't need you anymore. So a certain amount of time has to go by before I can be brought back because their bosses need to know that they feel capable of handling the job now that I'm gone. So you got to be gone for a while <laughs> before they can bring you back. That's so funny. If in five years you were to look back and look at all of the achievements you've made, or sorry, let me ask one more time. Five years from now, looking back, what would you be most proud of if you've accomplished X or Y in the next five years? That we were, have been established in a couple of different places in the world, and we're helping people in China, um, in India, in the Middle East. And we'd also become linked to uh, peacemaking and prosperity in places that need both. I love that. We have a little closing tradition. The podcast is called Erica Taught Me, but really today is all about Chris Voss Taught Me. So what do you want listeners to be able to walk away saying, Chris Voss Taught Me This? Um, that you can do it. All you got to do is put in the time. Don't pressure yourself to learn quickly. I, I put an adjustment on a phrase that's been adjusted twice. The phrase is, the only sustainable competitive advantage is to learn faster than your competition. Several business thinkers who promote learning have said that. It's been attributed to a couple of different people. Jack Welch says, learn faster than your competition and implement, act on what you learned. My tweak is you don't got to learn faster. You just got to keep learning. If you never give up, you can't lose. Molly Bloom told me that. You can't lose if you don't quit. So don't quit. Don't quit learning. Just learn a little bit every day. You'll be shocked at how far you get really quickly as soon as you take the pressure off yourself to learn fast. Thank you. If you enjoyed today's episode, I know you're going to love Chris Voss's book. It's called Never Split the Difference, and it's a personal favorite of mine. I'll leave that link in the show notes for you. And if you're enjoying the podcast, it would mean a lot to me if you could take just a minute to leave a review of the podcast wherever you're listening to it. Even just one sentence is so helpful and helps others to find our podcast. Thank you so much for choosing to spend your time with me today. I'm so excited to talk to you next Tuesday on a brand new episode of Erica Taught Me. See you there.